Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leaders series, Embracing Construction's Digital Revolution. My name is Amanda and I'll be your host for today. Firstly, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to their cultures and to elders, past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that today's webinar is being hosted with Engineers Australia's industry partner, Bentley Systems. Bentley Systems is the leading global provider of software solutions to engineers, architects, geospatial professionals, constructors and owner operators for the design, construction and operations of infrastructure. Bentley's microstation based engineering and BIM applications and its digital twin cloud services advance the project delivery, project wise, and the asset performance, asset wise, of transportation and other public works, utilities, industrial and resources plants, and commercial and institutional facilities. Today we will hear from two speakers, followed by our live audience QA session. I encourage you to send questions through to our speakers via the YouTube chat box as the presentations are happening today. I'd now like to welcome our first speaker for today, Mitchell Erickson. With over 15 years experience, Mitch has been in digital delivery roles in some of Australia's largest construction projects. Using a pragmatic, innovative and structural approach, these projects have been digitally delivered to exceed expectations. Working in Australia's largest tier one construction companies, Mitch has played a pivotal role in transforming the businesses into digital solution delivery through implementing working groups, digital in initiatives and engineering frameworks and developing innovative delivery techniques into scalable business processes. Please welcome Mitchell Erickson. Thank you, Amanda. Um, thank you for that introduction. So, um, so as Amanda, Amanda explained, so Mitch Erickson, Group Manager for Digital Engineering in, inside of John Holland. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is um, how, from a, const a construction contractor lens, um, how we embrace the, the digital revolution inside of that inside of that part of the business. So, I'm going to go through a few a few key topics, a few key topics today. Um, and explain how from, from its inception, how technology has grown within a construction business and definitely some of the challenges that we face um, deploying that piece of, piece of construction or concept into the business. So uh, in terms of an introduction, so um, I don't have to um, preach to anyone here in, the, in this um, session today, but definitely construction growth in the, in the construction or technology growth in the construction sector has been notoriously slow. Um, now, everyone's been impacted by a global pandemic. Some of the areas that how we can bounce back using um, technology with how big it's gotten in society and how we can build a, a tech-centric business direction and how that's going to work for a construction company um, and for everyone here coming from um, either an engineering or um, construction background. How can technology aid in this in the, in the industry? So. The, the the growth of efficient project schedules and delivery that's something that's been um, in intrinsically built um, off the back of pandemic with things like um, remote working um, increased focus on safety and safe work planning um, is definitely a core a core function within many con, um, construction businesses um, adapting dated processes and systems to now a lot of I know from looking after my wider team in a digital engineering front, how prevalent cloud technology and environments are compared to your, your standard um, desktop systems. Now we're moving more towards a, a cloud-based. And also how do we increase that footprint of technology across the industry? Um, not only in a contracting sense, but also into design houses and, and smaller um, small businesses. How, how can that potentially be um, done and grown? Um, so this webinar topic, I'm going to take members through uh, a timeline of adaption of construction technology, um, some of the challenges faced with technology adoption, how 
uh, a rough process of how converting technology into a business solution, which I think is a key message in the business, is copious amounts of new tech. How do we harness that and bring it into the business and use it as a solution? Um, what some of the technology shifts have been in construction, uh, what the current technology adoption looks like and um, what that technology facet looks like moving forward in, in the industry. As I touched on some of the agenda there, um, running through through the next part of these slides is just gonna you know, run through definitely uh, my experience working at two of the larger T1 contractors in Australia, um, as well as having some exposure to um, an Amer a large American firm when I worked there, the differences between um, process and technology adoption and how, Give everyone a bit of an insight of definitely how a large T1 um, construction contractor would adopt technology, both from a project delivery sense, but then as a, a corporate framework and, and dedicated resource that, that definitely has been my experience from both sides of the fence. Construction technology adoption. So as I, as I touched on previously, Notoriously, the construction industry has been slow to adopt that technology. Um, one of definitely one of my go-to go-to resources with with technology and construction is is McKinsey. So, as they've sort of discussed here, is the construction industry is ranked second from last um, in tw out of twenty one of twenty two digitized sectors. So, we've come in just above agriculture and hunting, which is still very much a hands on hands on industry. So the the digitization across some of those categories, spending, digitization of work, business processes, construction industry is very, very slow at adopting these principles. So there are many, many thoughts on this. So one, some of the things that I've definitely seen from my experience and my discussions around the industry with, with people that I interface regularly with, um, it was really prior to the 2000s that um, the industry was quite averse to move away from certain heavy people, heavy process structures. So still very much the same premise if you work on a construction site here here at any given time, there is still going to be a vast array of old manual dated process. So that's been definitely a challenge to bring technology into aid in those efficiencies. The second being procurement methodology. So still to this day in a lot of large linear infrastructure which has been my last couple of projects being involved in those procurement methods are still used off heavy industry so mining and metals for the large majority so you can tell that how different a construction project and how many different interfaces with the communities with technology with differing parts of the supply chain you may have six or seven different design consultants with varying scopes that potentially may be using different types of technology. So how we procure those services matters in how that technology is adopted. So if we're not writing procurement methodology that's going to aid in, a, aid in technology adoption, we're going to struggle to implement it once the projects start, getting, start kicking off and people start producing output. So also the perception of we're not being paid to do it, so why should we? So that's definitely... Um, for myself and a lot of other people um, in this webinar is that's something that probably a lot of us get questioned from a technology background quite extensively. And I'll run through everyone how I've, I've, I've gone through that challenge process where I think the perception of that is beginning to change because there has been enough project growth definitely in the east coast of Australia and definitely some, some smaller pockets on the west that there's been experiences and lessons learned coming out of these projects of why we would do a technology-based process, definitely a use in case. And from my from my wider team is a digital engineering front. Uh, a fragmented approach from different state to state. So some states are starting to come to the party with um, some guidelines and some, some loose um, structure around some standards. So that is great to see from definitely from, from the construction contractor side of the fence that we have some framework that we can adopt as well as adding our delivery mechanisms to aid in that. Uh, skill shortages, so um, definitely in the construction industry there is a, an ageing workforce and um, 
and not a lot of uptake definitely on the construction contractor side of the fence of people coming out of universities and graduates. I know there's some good graduate pipelines, but the technology focused roles, it's it's not as a bigger up, uptake as what we would have liked. Um, and finally, that the technology development mature enough to give tangible business benefits. So definitely from from my interfaces inside the, the corporate side of construction companies is is always show me the return. I'm willing to pay the money, but you've got to show me the return of investment. So if you're trialling a concept or, a, or doing a pilot, that's a very, very difficult task to do. So that's something that's, that's starting to, to grow and change. But these are some of the reasons why, from, from my perspective, that a lot of um, construction industry parties have found it difficult to adopt. Challenges and conversion. So, how do we how do we have that proof of concept? And what are some of the challenges of implementing that into a business? Um, it could be anything in terms of when I'm talking technology. It could be a new system, a new tool, a new process. Um, it could be something that drives efficiency into teams that have done something a certain way off and working off still off shear based assumption. So that is something where harnessing technology and some of the challenges that definitely not only myself, but I think a lot of people on this webinar are faced um, converting that into, into your businesses, whether that be your own or you're an employee of. So some of these six things are something that um, definitely get asked still um, on a regular basis. So the first one being the justification of a digital output in a physical project environment. So construction projects, um, still very much a hands-on physical activity, a lot of sense, and that's where a lot of the funding comes in and out of. So how do we as digital team members within that environment aid in that efficiency? So um, taking, for example, um, helping efficiencies drive into certain teams, um, one of the, as remedial as it sounds, one of the key ones is the introduction of digital forms to teams that would usually scribble that form on, on bits of paper. They get lost, they get lost in email trails. Hosting a common area where digital forms take place, as, as small and, and low key as that sounds, that is really beneficial to aiding efficiency on site. It's not the big, large model environment that's going to help them do different types of spatial viewing, but just encapsulating a small win and a solution to a small key, small key team is something that can be done fairly rapidly and, and build that efficiency in. Why do we need to pay for that technology? Can't we pay a consultant for that? Um, that's something that de definitely um, sits in my remit. It's something that I think in the last five years has changed a lot. Um, as you're seeing, um, a lot of key technology people being involved in construction companies, definitely from our side, We've seen the experiences come out of our core team members and like definitely speaking from our experience inside of John Holland, we we have a really mature DE team that that spans not only the Australian market, the New Zealand market, but also um, a lot of key experience in the European market. So that is happening. And I think that technology experience is coming into construction companies and adding that efficiency into those businesses to say, it's not only a design-led led effort. If we do, if we can increase efficiencies and track progress, this is how we can mitigate risk for construction project, which is still one of the key things in delivering uh, a physical construction effort. Overhead. So the big one is how can the business carry the overhead cost of this technology? Um, it is, it is potentially costly sometimes when adopting technology, especially if you're adopting something that's a disruptive type of technology and not, and not something that's going to align to your current system or process. It is going to be quite expensive and there may be a, a fairly steep learning curve, but what you're also doing and tying in with the next step of resourcing that is you're not only growing your businesses, but you're also growing your people's skill set in, inside of that. So we've definitely found um, in in a tier one construction sense is being able to have, for instance, an engineering graduate, which a lot of you on this webinar may be, is 
coming into the business and then spatially enabling those team members. They may be come in as a, a site engineer or a, des, or, a, or a design coordinator, coming in and giving them a digital skill set to enhance their already um, their already engineering background or whatever university um, degree you may have come from. It grows that skill set in that team member and also what it does for, for definitely within my team at the moment is it allows us to increase the footprint while giving someone a new skill set, which I think they'll take to multiple different projects they go to. And then what that does is it, it sparks information back into the wider team, which I think is, is really, really important that definitely from my perspective, re- leading a team of 12 at the moment is those ideas coming in and out is crucial to my team being successful. Um, concerns over integration of new tech with existing systems and process. And look, that ties in too with um, internal business processes maybe a little bit immature to, hot, to hold or or um, or prop up that new technology. So they're definitely two large challenges. And I think definitely from my experience, the, the challenges in those is seeing and baselining that foundational requirement that you have in your businesses. So that may be bringing a new concept or a new technology to your business. If it's undermining or creating new new process and new structure, there is a view there that look, that can be this technology can be used as a disruptor to your business. It can be a positive or negative shift on that. So you can have that challenge come in and actually improve your business or improve your people or align a, a better philosophy on how you're going to continue to grow that because. As we've seen with technology in society, it's it's not a one-stop shop. We're not going to just implement something and it's going to stay the same. These adoptions and these challenges will, will be forever ongoing because they need constant integration and constant adaption and constant growth, which I think most businesses would, would guarantee is a future step forward. It's not something that you want to adopt a piece of kit or adopt a, a process and just leave it let it sit, and then that's going to do everything for you for the next five to 10 years. That's been the big challenge for us in construction companies is we've adopted this technology. It's great. It's implemented. It's rolling quite well. Now the next thing is to manage it, optimize it, and grow it. So it's an ongoing thing. So that's where you've seen the definitely the growth in, in technology teams inside of construction companies. And I think it's only going to get larger and larger as, as technology and society continues to grow. Converting concepts into solutions. So this is something I definitely preach to to my wider teams is technology is only good as a solution development that you bring in the back end. So there is a lot of tools, a lot of um, technology that we can implement um, pretty quickly, but unless it's done properly and, and, and brought in and solutioned out to be a key return of investment for the business, as I touched on earlier, is it's got to go through logical steps to actually get the buy-in from not only tech teams within construction companies, they know the buy-in, they understand it. It's about harnessing that key tech concept, but then allowing it to be scalable and and usable to the business and not in a one-off application. So definitely the the six steps I'm going to run you through here is something that I've used in the past that's worked really well is is step one is or stage one is is change. So what is the concept or the idea? Is it based on efficiency, cost saving, or is it a new technology adaption? And and bottoming that out, that look, they may that may be a business case, that may be a, a pilot that you're looking at doing. It it needs to convert into an opportunity, which is stage two. So reviewing that applicability of the concept to the current business structure. Like I said before, is that it is it a disruptor? Is it an enabler? Is it an efficiency build? And how are we going to build the current system or process and have that internal development cycle? So logically, you would bottom those two core foundation elements out and then go into what we would classify and definitely um, a software vendor term is pilot testing or, or a POC, which is a proof of concept, which, which means we've tried it on a small key area and we know that we want to move forward. So how do we build that foundation? So how do we baseline that pilot into, does it work with our current systems? Can we pressure test it? 
and does it make sense to the wider business? So does it provide the basis of a solution? Can we scope it out if we're potentially going to look at um, key stakeholders in the business, especially with cost or governance or assurance pieces within the business? Does it work? Or are we introducing a bottleneck further down the line of project development? So next step is project test. So testing that within the project of small key areas um, that may be with on project staff and get their point of view on how that works. That feedback is critical because definitely from solution development away from projects, which, which, um, which a lot of my team look at is unless the project's buying in on the concept, it's not going to float because if it's too hard to work, that barrier to entry is just too far for teams to pick up. So stage four, repeatability and scalability. So definitely a, a key focus for, for tier one construction companies because we don't do projects that are in one um, discipline or size. Our projects are vast and different sizes of scope, scale and, and project value. So can this be applicable across different functions or different teams, different different internal business processes and different project scopes. So that is a huge one for us is if it's repeatable, the more buy-in we get, the more proof of concepts and the more rigor we can put around the concept. Next, stage five, manage and govern. So this system has passed passed through the through the gates. It's looking like getting some funding. System-wise, as technology grows, it's only as good as its management and governance piece. So how, what are the rules around the application? How does it, what access levels are we going to give to teams? How are we going to manage um, different project types? How are we going to report progress out of the system? Or how are we going to get some metrics to explain to some of the upper management of this was applied, this is the savings we got from it. So then going into the business implementation and the optimization, like I touched on earlier with the challenges is it's here, it's working. How do we grow it from here? And that's pretty much day one after the implementation phase is what potential integrations can we look at down the turn? So we're definitely from our perspective, are we head of our competitors or potential bids? How can we bring that efficiency and make that a business as usual, converting a concept to end game? business as usual and the business uses it. Technology shift. Um, so the movements and shift in construction technology, what's, what started that? So definitely the one of the big key factors is, um, I think on a timeline scale is essentially in 2007 was uh, the release of the iPhone through, through Apple. So what that's done to definitely from a construction company's perspective is that's that was the true functionality of a, a wireless um, a mobility on a site. So the ability to have that, say that web browser, that application or those early sort of fundamental days of app production, that was a big, big change definitely for our site team. So definitely the core function of if we take, for example, a digital engineering team being the management, the control, um, the reporting based out of a design design phase has still very much done the uptake in technology, but still very much the same with that core management exercise. The big change has been the rapid, the rapid production of smartphone and tablets and other bits pieces of kit that can be allow our teams to be mobile. Um, what impact has the shift in that technology had for construction companies? So what we're definitely seeing in the Australian and New Zealand market, um, from my experience, is that rapid changing of client expectations. So these owner and operators, they've embraced digitally connected assets, whether we're talking about um, the growth of smart cities arrangements, whether that be um, piloting digital twin outputs, um, they really have embraced that digital change because coming from an owner operator eyes, that digital facet is how they're going to interact with whether that be a hospital or whether that be a, a road network, that's how their interconnectivity will work. So ourselves as, as construction contractors that deliver those projects, we need to run to catch up to those owner operators and make sure our offering suits that perspective. 
um, technology enhancements, so capacity of, of technology, the bandwidth, the growth of, of Wi-Fi enablement, affordability is a big one too. Um, technology adoption in those early days was quite expensive. Um, now some of the, you can get a, low, a sort of a low-cost methodology um, if you're doing a, a, a pilot and then you can justify the business. We did this with this costing bracket. If we were to go to something larger and more, more meaningful, it would cost X amount so we can see the return of investment. So that's big in terms of concept build. Um, the big big thing out of the US, especially, and it is happening a lot here in in the um, Asia Pacific market too, is, is is the investment into construction startups. So that little metric there definitely from um, McKinsey is between 2014 and 2019, there's $25 billion of capital being brought into engineering and technology um, businesses in the US. So that's an increase of $8 billion from the previous five years. And that's that's that ties in quite well because a lot of our software vendors are based out of the US. So that amount of startup and everyone that's, that's dealt with um, either a drafting and modeling or or a site-based mobile mobile tool will have seen those companies are are growing that large that they're having so many different software integrations coming into those businesses because because of these because of these investment they are growing and integrating copious amounts of different tools they're buying from the market or developing themselves so that's been a huge change definitely for for ourselves in a in a construction environment now, it's like, as I touched on earlier, one of the challenges of growth that was happening was the way procurement methodologies have worked. That is starting to change. Um, we are seeing that from uh, definitely a linear infrastructure perspective. There is large um, projects now moving towards, um, for instance, like an NEC4 contract, which is a lot more collaborative and less onerous on the old DNC structure of a procurement methodology. So that enhancement to collaborate with not only the design supply chain, but also other aspects of the of a project life cycle. So that will only grow technology as we collaborate and make tool sets and make things easier and build efficiencies and learnings from each, from each partner, whether that be a JV on a construction project or a, a designer um, coming in to deliver that design. The big one, um, and still this impacts pretty much a lot of people on the call and has done for the last couple of years, uh, is remote working. So being able to be remote while working on different areas of, of projects or different um, locations has been huge. Um, common data environments aren't anything new in the, in the industry, but they were a large step change with, um, with definitely with design houses wanting to use overseas entities um, being able to have multiple different parties working on different different types of projects has been huge for the construction industry and something that we enable on a lot of projects um, day in, day out, because it does allow for that time and efficiency to, to be done quite regularly. Um, from a COVID pandemic sense, it's been these cloud systems have been key for us keeping projects open, which um, in turn has kept people in employment. So that is something that um, we look to do with any sort of technology growth is can it be done or can it be hosted remotely to allow for that flexible work arrangements, which um, was another slow adoption of construction companies, but one that's definitely changed in the last couple of years. And the last one is technology vendors. So they are they have increased their digital transformation offerings. Um, that is key in developing um, not only the relationship between construction um, department, construction contractor and vendor, but also it increases the offering to get the software to run and actually exceed your expectations. So building integrations with the software development companies to make sure that we're, when we're developing something, we get the, the tool offering, they get the skill set, and then it's a very much a lot closer um, relationship than potentially what it was prior. Current technology adoption. So, what are some of the areas that um, that are currently used in a in a technology environment inside a construction contractor? So, um, one at the top, probably near and dear to my heart, um, digital engineering. So, um, 
establishing that tool and that system that system enabled um, business so um, a lot of t1 as i said a lot of construction contractors have quite a large de team in there now so what that does is it allows it allows construction companies to handle and manage information so the the model geometry so the 3d visual is 100 percent a useful useful tool but the ability to house data and data sets which is now front and center of how we manage and and deliver projects not only internally but also to client markets um, to also um, enable future project life cycle phases so that's been a large a large undertaking and developing that um, developing that basis is a very very difficult one because de is a centralized facilitator other parts of the business and as I touched on, big data and analytics. So that's something that DE teams have had to run to catch up is we've become very much um, fluent in, in in data and understanding database, relational databases, how data structures work, how they're deployed, how they're tracked, how they're verified, how they're managed, how they're reported to internal teams, to upper management, to, to head office. So that level of growth has been so quickly and definitely in the last few projects that i've been involved in how quickly some of the team members have had to have to have had to think on their feet is is really quite remarkable in terms of where we've come from to potentially where we are now the ability of some of the especially even the grads coming out of um the institutions at the moment is their fluency within data it exceeds expectations all the time definitely for for ourselves at at jh Safety and design. So the growth of, of of renders and model engines that are coming out in, in some of these software vendors now, it enables us to to spatially host safety and design workshops now. So that was something that was always done through running through reports and drawings and and some potential sections at any given time. We've undertaken a lot of work in this space, definitely from the the, the larger construction houses is the ability to run those sessions with teams in a spatial environment. So essentially putting the team members at that location with the build, with potentially with the interface between permanent and temporary works has been a huge growth part of uh, current technology adoptions because giving the possibility of those team members that they may be looking at something that's 12, 18 months down the track, they're looking at it in real time and planning their work whether that be from a safety aspect or from a logistical movement perspective, that is that's a huge efficiency built in that teams are comfortable using that tool. And this took quite a while to build that to get that confidence in those site teams that have been used to doing something a certain way for quite some time. So that's been a, a large adoption and a, and a really successful one. The VR and AR, so virtual reality and augmented reality, this was definitely one of the larger battles I know for, from my own experience, getting this adoption to be a business as usual solution into the business because it was always seen as a nice to have piece of technology. It was always a little bit gimmicky. It was always um, a bit far reaching. You've got to put the headset on. It was always a, a fairly tough sell inside the business. But when we, when we adapt it to a concept of, for example, um, one of the high risk construction activities that we have in a lot of our sites is subsurface utilities. So in ground utilities, we may not know where they are. They may be new, they may be existing, they may be proposed, but to be able to augment that model software and you have an iPad and you can hover it over a location that's geo-referenced in a GIS environment, for example, to be able to show what's potentially going to be built there or what's existing is a really powerful tool, especially for that high risk activity where the potential to hit an existing utility may cost a lot of time and pressure on the project, but also mitigate the the impact the project's got to the surrounding area. So that's been a huge development, definitely for for our wider teams to use that as a solution. It is something that we roll out fairly regularly now. Um, construction methodology simulations. So um, what everyone would be comfortable with the term is four D sequencing. Um, and this is something that I definitely know Paul will touch on with his 
with his slides um, is how powerful that definitely is for construction teams. So everyone's benefit, the amount of interaction between construction and design teams can be somewhat um, com- somewhat convoluted just because of mobility issues, resources, um, timing of, be- of inputs during design. But when we use it in a simulation sense, we get the impact and the buy-in from the construction teams and then we can make the effort during design to aid that constructability purpose, which has been a really, really successful undertaking, similar to the safety and design, is allowing that spatial information to teams that would somewhat not see it, but now are not only adapting, but they're taking ownership of these pieces and ensuring that their pieces of work are done and, it, and the schedule is not impacted. Because the best thing about what we do now with the 4D sequence is is testing the planning logic and making sure that line items on the plan of a construction project live up to what they need to what they need to do and there's enough time factor in for for instance like for girders coming in to be shipped in to be moved in a place with a crane is that crane size going to fit in and not clash with the existing building surrounding there so they're all things that we do test now and that's something that a lot of these five elements in that list there are now pretty much business as usual for not only my wider team, but I dare say a lot of construction um, company teams. So what's next? Um, what do we see as being the next protocol? Um, so one of the things that we're looking to develop definitely um, from a JH sense and um, definitely from what I've seen in project delivery on, on the left-hand side, um, essentially what, this is some of the current technology that we've got in house or currently testing as a proof of concept. And what does that future technology advancement? This is something that we're building in at the moment and ensuring that we can enable in the future. So big one for us is high definition survey and geolocation. So the amount and the size of some of these survey files that come in definitely from not only existing, but also proposed are so large that that they're fairly difficult to handle at any given time. So looking at um, working with really um, a lot of software vendors in the survey space, but also key experience surveyors on how we optimise that. So building towards something like an autonomous cloud processing and an inbuilt optimization, um, that is something that would save a lot of time off. And there are tools that do it now, but there are, as I said, when we do proof of concepts and when we develop into solutions, it needs to be efficient because otherwise we get that barrier to entry and we don't get that uptake. Um, project controls integration, so project controls being time, cost, um, things like earn value with um, schedule information. What we're looking to develop there, we do have some tools that do this already, but essentially how do we automate some of that? How do we get um, some machine learning to do some of those repetitive tasks for us over the weekend that we may be off spending time with with family and and that automated machine learning is doing crunching those numbers for us that we come in the morning on Monday morning and there's an output there for us. That is already happening, but what we're looking at doing is in building that verification piece because it can do the machine learning and it does do a fairly decent job, but the verification piece that you know when you come in, you can trust that information. That's the big thing with data is making sure that we can trust that information is accurate. IoT and sensor analytics, so something that um, definitely looking at an environmental sense, um, dust and noise sensors out on sites and how they're, how those analytics pull back in, whether that be tracking of spoil out of projects, that, that gets done fairly regularly now. but. How do we get that live digital feedback? So that automated daily progress tracking is so powerful to not only not only um, the user but also the site teams and the site management that they can keep abreast is how do we use construction technology to to not only track but also underpin people's decision making? How do we make that more efficient? How do we make people have the information at their fingertips, updated regularly, and they can trust that information? Drones and autonomous vehicles. So definitely you'll see a lot of drones out on projects. Um, 
looking at things like autonomous vehicles um, for ourselves, being a, a, a tunnel contractor and a con- tunnel constructor in, in the business, autonomous vehicles flying through, um, like drones flying through tunnels, is something that has always been something that would have been fantastic to have. That technology is now present. So how do we look at things like advanced robotics and and how that control method comes in? Can we look at potentially having a tunnel alignment? We plot a tunnel alignment and we have a drone that flies on that direct alignment the whole way through. Like that's something that's, that take five years ago that would have been fairly significant and quite out far-fetched, but now it's not out of the realm of possibility with how things are developing at the moment. Um, some of the other, so I'm going to run through a couple here of some of the ones that um, internally we're having a look at. So everyone's quite familiar with the term digital twin. Um, but what essentially when our, our constructor, um, construction contractor lens on things is how do I use it to enhance delivery? The, the digital twin being really prevalent in the, the owner operator space. How do I use information within that model to drive efficiencies in project delivery. That's something that's really key for my teams and our projects is how do we enhance things like sensor information? How do we able to give that feedback? Like live data flows, um, feedback coming in from the physical to ourselves and we can start mapping that. How do we efficiently go out and do as-built scanning operations and get as much information from the physical asset to the, to the digital one? That is th- there's their stepping box to how do we get to this endpoint, and it is something that you'll see in the industry. So it is it is quite um, it is quite a polarizing term, definitely from d- depends which background you come from. But I think the more it enables a, a digital output, I think it's positive. I think you put your own spin on how that works and how that interacts with your daily um, tasks and interface. But definitely from our wider from my wider team, that's how we're looking at the twin is how we can deliver projects with enhancing the, the digital side of things coming coming out of design. Artificial intelligence, so tying into that machine learning piece too, is where a lot of construction companies are going from not only just physical builders, but we're also looking at the price and the adaption of being um, SMEs in the data world. So not only are we, are we building data on our projects, but we're also looking at how do we enhance those? So how do we pull things from IoT devices? How do we get information in from different types of sources? How do we apply machine learning to, again, aid in project delivery? Because that's what the business that myself and my wider team in is. How do we how do we enhance the supply chains? How do we look at doing asset management? How do we structure that properly to enable a potential client? Or how do we have this information and do it that underpins our business now, but also future proofs, proofs in the future for integrations? So how are we going to potentially integrate different apps, different types of sensors, different types of data and reuse it, transform it and, and u- utilize it longer term? That is an ongoing and evolving conversation and everyone on this call will interface with that at some way given time. But as a business and developing those solutions, how do we do that with the help again of software vendors and different parties? How we are building that is something that we're um, looking to underpin at the moment. Autonomous robots, so um, something that is definitely being looked at as I as I explained in that tunnel reference is how do we utilize that for again delivery sense. It's always going to be a delivery lens with someone like myself coming from a construction contractor is how can we mitigate site risks and, and safety issues by having someone holding it, walking around for copious amounts of time, holding a, a scanner or holding a, a piece of survey equipment. Can we potentially put that on a robot? Can it be controlled? One of the, one of the largest things that's happened, and it's not autonomous by any sense of the means, but the amount of our... Like definitely with our some of our like our lift and shift teams being able to use SPMTs moving huge amounts of weight on projects that was always always done in a mining sector, but we're seeing them definitely a lot of our projects is moving girders and moving heavy pieces of kit that 
it, it can move on it and complete a complete 360 degree turn on itself. So again, aiding in delivery, that's where the lens that we put over these things is how can we adapt this technology to suit us as a deliver, a deliverer of projects? And that's what we'll be looking for in an autonomous sense is that key gap we've got is the scanning. We've got scanning equipment, but can we bolt it to the back of a, an autonomous robot and have a controller that's got a, a keypad in his hands rather than a heavy backpack with a with a LiDAR scanning kit? And that's that's my presentation. I appreciate everyone's time. Everyone's very, very busy at the moment. Um, I, I hope everyone got, got as much out of that um, presentation and definitely from the construction contractor lens, we do look at things a little bit differently, but definitely um, I know from myself and my wider team, very, very excited to see where the construction industry is going to go with um, with its adoption. It has changed rapidly recently as I, as I sort of touched on, but I think that growth and that mechanism and the people that we have in the businesses now from a technology background, they are driving this. And I think the more that we can grow that capability within these teams, the better not only the projects will be delivered, but the actual businesses themselves will, will be far better off for it. Thank you, Mitchell, for your insights. I'd now like to welcome our second speaker, Paul King. Paul is a passionate advocate of construction innovation and global best practice in using technology solutions in the built environment. As a chartered engineer with broad experience of designing, constructing and operating infrastructure, Paul enjoys helping organisations and projects to develop competitive advantage, generate business improvement and manage risk. In Paul's role at Bentley, he works across Southeast Asia, India, Australia and New Zealand, advising construction industry participants on collaborative working and BIM. Paul speaks regu regularly at infrastructure industry events and has supported major projects such as Crossrail, Mazda City and London 2012. Please welcome Paul King. Hello everyone. My name is Paul King and I work in the construction team at Bentley Systems. I'm delighted to be speaking to you today and I'm pleased that so many of you want to learn about using technology to deliver better infrastructure projects. Over the last two years, the industry has done whatever it takes to deliver projects despite huge challenges. But the uncertainties faced by engineering and construction firms are set to worsen as governments begin to boost their post-COVID spending on infrastructure. We're at a turning point where we can choose to embrace the technology revolution that's underway. And I'm going to explain how technology is helping firms to win projects, deliver them more efficiently and improve their profitability. Bentley Systems is the infrastructure engineering software company, and we provide software for the world's infrastructure. It's used by professionals and organizations of every size for designing, constructing, and operating every type of infrastructure. And when I talk about infrastructure, I really do mean every type of infrastructure project and through the entire project life cycle, from planning and design, through construction and onto asset operations. Today, I'm focusing on construction. Construction matters for the world economy but it's got a long record of poor productivity. Construction-related spending accounts for up to 13% of the world's GDP, but the sector's annual productivity growth has only gone up by about 1% over the last 20 years. $1.6 trillion of extra value could be created through higher productivity, and that would meet half the world's infrastructure need. And construction has a big impact on the world, and not always in a good way. Cement production creates huge amounts of carbon dioxide, and if the cement industry were a country, it would be the world's third largest emitter. But that creates opportunities for innovation and creativity. Over the last two years, the industry has done whatever it takes to deliver projects. And many of their challenges were around long before COVID. COVID just made them worse. For example, 
within organizations, it can be hard to manage and use the vast amount of data that's available. It's difficult to scale best practices across the organization, and it's hard to attract and retain the best people and use them to best effect on projects. Outside the organization, there are industry-wide challenges that amplify internal problems, things like complex projects and the interconnected teams that have to deliver them. There's also fragmented value chains and extensive use of subcontracting. And none of these make projects any easier. So COVID has added another layer of challenge on top of those. But COVID has accelerated the adoption of new technology, and it's changing how construction firms operate. I'll give some examples later. Just to show how big construction is, the floor area of the world's buildings is projected to double in the next 40 years. And that's only for buildings. It's important to remind ourselves of the issues we face because organizations and projects don't buy and implement software just for the sake of it. They buy software to help them deliver better projects. A recent report shows the opportunity to do things better. It found that the average large project takes 20% longer than planned and can be 80% over budget. The project numbers help to explain why. There are more than a million people, or a thousand people, I should say, uh, from nearly 200 companies sharing over 2 million documents. Technology can play an important part in changing how we design and execute projects and also how we reskill the workforce. But construction is complicated. In fact, building any type of asset is complicated, as you can see when you look at what's needed to deliver a railway project. We don't just design the railway and then go and build it. Software plays a key role in planning, designing, analyzing, constructing, and then managing the asset. And the activities on this screen are complicated enough on their own and are often performed by different organizations in different countries using different software. The construction team on site must take all this data and information and use it to deliver the railway on time and within budget. And that budget is usually set by a competitive tender process, so every dollar makes a difference. And these are some of the typical technologies you'll see being used on projects today. Everything from 2D up to mixed reality. I've highlighted 4D planning to show the benefit that even simple advancements can bring. Ryan in the US saves four weeks off the schedule for every eight months of construction. Should you be doing all of these? Maybe not, but you should be considering when and how you'll get started. And also ask yourself, what are my competitors using? Because technology is changing your competitors. Construction's always been slow to change, but technology is changing the competition for everyone. Designers, builders, manufacturers, and software vendors. The blue line shows how we tend to make small advances and then use them for long periods before shifting again. But the pace of change is accelerating. It's much easier to try new bits of technology to see if they work. If they do, we keep them and try something new. If they don't, we stop and try something else. And this much more agile approach means that companies can start to quickly move ahead of their competi uh, competition. And when I talk to companies, they're less concerned about where they are on one of the curves and much more interested in where their competitors are. Constructioneering is a term that we use to describe how all these bits of technology fit together. And it's driven by five technology trends. The first is next generation BIM. So many projects are still working in a BIM level one environment without using a collaboration process. Next generation BIM uses the latest BIM tools combined with best practice common data environments. Second is collaboration and mobility. Cloud-based connected data environments transform projects because they enable real-time collaboration. A common data environment is a part of that connected data environment. And it means that users can access data from anywhere at any time on any device. Third is near-perfect data capture. 
high resolution images and 3D models can be produced in near real time using GPS, uh, photogrammetry and LIDAR. Drones and handheld scanners are improving the accuracy and quality of surveys and reducing the time needed to capture the source data. Fourth is the Internet of Things. Sensors can track real-time data from equipment, from crews and materials, and cloud computing enables that data to be analyzed in near real time. Gathering and exploiting that data improves cost control, decision-making, uh, risk management and site safety. Fifth is autonomous navigation. Autonomous machines are appearing more frequently on site. But, of course, if you're using a new robotic digging machine, you need to make sure it's digging the right hole in the right place at the right time based on the right model. But it can be a challenge for teams to catch up with and use the available technology. Academy programs are a proven way to educate, train and support teams to achieve better outcomes. In my experience, successful projects ensure they get the basics right, and they spend time and effort implementing best practices. There's a lot of interest and activity around digital twins, but it's not something you can just turn off or on when you need to. They offer huge potential to improve project delivery, but they build on existing best practices, and you must get the basics right. It starts with creating high quality components. And creating components means vertical and linear assets, as with this railway example. The industry's got access to the latest design and BIM technology, and it's important to get the design right. And it has to be complete, consistent, and correct. Next, best practice workflows ensure your data is managed securely and effectively. A common data environment, or CDE, supports a robust BIM process. And a CDE is actually a simple principle. It stores and manages content created by the team, and it delivers that to the right people in the right format at the right time for the task. And the recent ISO standard makes it easy to use best practice collaboration. But why should you care about collaboration and information management? Well, KPMG reported last year that information management could secure up to $6 of direct labor gains for every dollar invested, and up to more than $7 in direct cost savings from reductions in time and materials. And here's an example of the benefits on a project. Mott McDonald worked on the design of the Thames Tideway project in London. It's one of the UK's largest ever water projects. They had 12 design disciplines across Europe, and their CDE enabled them to cut design time by a third simply by using best practice for collaboration. Moving on to context. Surveying technology means it's easy to place and review components in their correct context. In this example, I'm inspecting a rusty column and I've taken a series of photos on a phone. The context capture cloud service converts them into an accurate 3D model that I can review on my phone and share with other team members or I could use it to model the excavation of underground services. Of course, most projects have data in different formats from different sources, so it's important to consider the alignment, accountability, and accessibility of data. Data alignment ensures that you can take design information from different software applications and reuse it. Data accountability means that you know who created the information, and what it can be used for. Data accessibility ensures that your construction teams can get the information they need by using their preferred device and wherever they are. In Bentley, we've developed an open source way of doing this called iTwins. iTwins let projects uh, store, manage, and use different types of data in a cloud database. And iTwins are enabled by three key technologies. First, iModels. And these are a container for digital components. The iModel hub manages and maintains all of the changes in that data over time. 
And iModelJS is the open source technology that enables anyone to create their own applications and services for digital twins. So iTwins technology is the backbone that enables the construction of digital twin. This is an example of a tool built by a third party developer using iTwins technology. It's a virtual excavation tool that combines design and as built data to produce an augmented reality experience on a mobile device. And this tool was developed by EarthCam. They provide real time video monitoring of construction sites, and their video feeds can be blended with data from 4D construction models. Project managers can overlay a model showing planned progress with images and video of actual progress. And importantly, it's working with trusted data from the project's connected data environment. So how does this come together on a project? Well, content creators work in their preferred authoring tools. The iTwin service aligns the various inputs to a common data format, and it's stored in a cloud database. Team members can then access the data to use in their own work. So they get access to the trusted data they need when they need it and in the right format for their task. If your construction team is using Synchro, for example, then they work with the connected data environment through simple apps and web browsers. And when you have the components and the workflows and the context, then you have the basis for a construction digital twin. The simplest definition is that it's a digital representation of a physical asset process or system. But a twin is a living thing, so it must be continuously synchronized. And it should use data-driven workflows to optimize performance. From a technology perspective, digital twins are being enabled by advances in areas such as reality modeling, artificial intelligence, mixed reality, and machine learning. And more of this technology is becoming available every day, and it's getting a lot cheaper. So what about the more exciting developments? This is Spot, the robotic dog, walking around the laboratory, and it costs around $75,000. But they're beginning to appear on site. They can navigate stairs and obstacles, and this one is photographing a steelwork connection. So they're starting to find practical applications out in the real world. At the less glamorous end of the market, there's a road marking machine. It's not as much fun as a robotic dog, but it's probably a lot more cost effective. And robots are getting smarter, more effective and cheaper every day. And I really wonder how long it's gonna be before these machines are dancing around construction sites in Australia. Now let's dive into some digital twin workflows to explain the benefits. And there can be multiple digital twins throughout the life cycle of an asset. Users at all stages can make better informed decisions for better outcomes. The construction digital twin involves inputs of data. And these are things like uh, design drawings and models, a pre-construction information and feeds from the field. And it uses these inputs to support construction workflows. And these are things like 4D planning processes, model-based estimating, and machine automation. And the result is a jump in productivity. And there are three steps to working with digital twins. And I'll show you some examples. Step one involves gathering the design information and reality models. And these are transformed into a construction model. In step two, the construction model is connected to real-time updates from the field. And that can be from sensor feeds or maybe it's mobile app data. And that creates the live model. In step three, the live model can be leveraged with things like analytical tools, machine learning and augmented reality. So step one is where we assemble the construction data. In this example, we're viewing that data in a web browser. There's a city scale reality model generated with photographs taken from a drone or a helicopter. 
we've got the design model and it's placed in the correct position. So we've given it context. I can choose which model elements to view and I can select which objects and data to see in the browser. So I can section the model, I can measure distances and interact with design and construction information in ways that are meaningful to me for my tasks. Behind the scenes, the connected data environment ensures that I'm working with accurate and trusted data. In this case, scheduling and task data are added to the model to simulate the construction sequence. You can make mistakes in the model, not in the field, and optimize the path of construction. The model consists of constructible components that are fully loaded with the work breakdown structure and the quantity data. Of course, construction teams still use a lot of paper, and most projects use a mix of digital and paper documents. A risk with using paper is that drawings might be out of date, and that could result in a claim for extra work by a subcontractor. By automatically adding a QR code to a paper drawing when it's printed, the subcontractor can check that he's got the latest version before starting work. If it is the latest version, he sees a green tick, if it's been superseded, he gets a red cross. And subcontractors know they must scan a drawing before using it, because otherwise they might not get paid if they use an old version. It's easy to do, and everybody saves time and money. And this is an example of connecting the model to live reality data captured using a drone. In a web browser, you can view the design model, the latest reality data, and the construction sequence. A colored dot shows where someone's raised an RFI or an issue. And because this is an intelligent model, I can click on a component and interrogate the data. And I can access the data I need, when I need it, through a browser, without wondering if it's the right version. Of course, a lot of construction data is acquired using a digital twin process. And in this example, live models are used to investigate different scenarios for the path of construction and also to compare the planned and actual progress. Issues can be identified early, and it helps to keep the project in control by enabling faster decisions. And why should you care about that? Well, here's an example of why you should care. It's the one Zaabil project, and it's a new landmark building in Dubai. It's an example of a project that used 4D construction modeling to improve the project delivery process. And it was a finalist at Bentley's 2019 Year in Infrastructure Awards. The two towers are linked by a steel bridge, and it includes the world's largest cantilever. The link itself weighs more than 8,000 tonnes, and that's heavier than the iron in the Eiffel Tower. Because of the size and complexity of the project, the main contractor embraced 4D construction. At the end of last year, 4D modeling had taken 70 days off the program, thanks to clash detection and better planning. And the project has saved $16 million by giving clearer visibility into the structure and the schedule. By using 4D modeling early in the project, they detected clashes that would have been really expensive to fix. And importantly, these were not 3D design clashes. They were clashes in site operations and construction logistics which are really hard to find during design. 4D modeling identified other opportunities to save time and money. Uh, one example found a clash between a crane and the steel bridge. The openings in the structure for the crane didn't allow it to jump up before the bridge was installed. And if the clash had happened during construction, it would have delayed the erection of the bridge. And because the bridge was on the critical path, the whole project could have been late. 4D modeling helped to plan how to avoid that delay, which saved 40 days and $12 million in costs. So how can a construction digital twin help your project? Well, it provides real-time data visibility, so everyone's always on the same page. It provides 4D planning and 5D estimating, so that resources are optimized and risks are reduced. And it provides operational efficiencies and business intelligence so that teams make better decisions faster. And why is that important today? Well, it's important because digital twins are helping to address three big themes affecting the industry right now. 
The first one is market disruption, which is really driving firms to plan, manage, and execute their projects better. Most construction firms have had really low margins for many years. And when I worked for a large construction firm, finishing the year with a 2% margin was considered really good. But low margins leave almost no room for error. And firms are, are facing supply chain constraints, uh, overseas competition, and increasing complexity. And of course, COVID hasn't gone away. Talent shortage is another pressing problem for the industry. We just don't have enough good people entering the industry and companies find it hard to retain them because of competition. Secondly, digital technology is changing how construction firms operate. Smart project management makes it possible to make better decisions about managing labor and materials on a project. And real-time progress monitoring provides a forward-looking insight to enable you to better control activities. And smart scheduling tools give a clear competitive, competitive advantage. And robots are also starting to appear on site, from simple line marking machines to brick laying devices to creepy robot dogs performing inspections. And drones are now common, performing inspections that could be dangerous for humans and surveying huge areas of land very quickly. Artificial intelligence is also starting to have an impact. During construction planning, it's enabling predictive design, optioneering, virtual reality, and construction logistics planning. On site, it's enabling cloud-hosted connected data environments that foster collaboration and process vast quantities of real-time data. And thirdly, the global infrastructure pipeline is huge, which is good and bad. On the plus side, governments are beginning to make up for years of underinvestment in roads, bridges, and water systems. Around the world, governments are uh, allocating billions of dollars, if not trillions, to funding infrastructure projects. But the industry has a limited number of people to support them. So we need new ways of delivering projects that are less adversarial. And it's crucial to start exploiting technology so we can start to do a lot more with a lot less. In conclusion, construction is starting to shift in the right direction. We're moving from the old ways of doing things to new ways. Construction software is enabling project teams to define and implement best practice processes and to do that consistently across every project. Digitization means that everyone can be on the same page at the same time and make better decisions faster. It means that resources can be optimized uh, risk can be mitigated and rework can be avoided. And it means that teams spend more time working on value-added tasks. And ultimately, construction technology is helping firms to win projects, deliver them more efficiently and improve their profitability. And I hope that each one of you is inspired to develop Australia's construction industry into one that's smart, sustainable and efficient. Thank you, Mitchell and Paul, and what great robots at the end. It's now your turn, time to get involved, so if you'd like to submit a question, please do, please do so via the chat box. If you could please leave your name and who the question is for. Um, we did receive some questions on registration, so we'll begin with one of those. And the first question is direct to Mitch, and it's coming from Nirav in Victoria asking, do you think some sort of legislative requirement to adhere to digital technology requirement standards will further improve the uptake of digitization in the construction industry and in delivery of major projects, citing being mandated by the UK government? Uh, Mitch. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, yeah, I think it will. Um, at the moment, there's some, there's some states and and governing bodies that have produced guidelines and best practices. So I still I still think there's a little way to go in, in, in producing that for Australia just because some of the states are in different levels of maturity and, and development from what they've seen. But it is coming and I think definitely from the larger two contractors that I've worked with, we we've adhered to a, an ISO nineteen six fifty um, framework and certification which puts 
some rigor around the information management side, so sharing of information from one party to another. But I think once once we do look at rolling out a, a standard or a legis legislative requirement, it would be very similar to something the UK or the likes of Sweden have done and some other European nations that have rolled out with varying levels of success. And I think that's um, very much for construction type environments and projects is they do have varying levels of skill sets, commercial undertaking, procurement methodology. There is a lot of moving parts. So hence probably why it's taken quite some time for something to happen here in Australia. But I think it will help. It does put structure around when we write our requirements for project delivery. So anything that can help prop that up and give some transparency to the market, I think is is a um, is a positive step forward. Thanks, Mitch. And it is something we've been talking about for, for quite a long time. So I just wonder, Paul, do you do you have a view, a perspective on that? On the man, on the, the encouragement and mandating of yes. requirements. Yes. Yeah. It's a, it is interesting. And having seen what the UK did, as as Mitch referenced, um, there was a lot of, of discussion in the industry about whether it was right or not. And what I found interesting was a lot of firms had got on several years before that and just started doing it because they looked at the technology that was available. They recognized it made sense for their business to implement it uh, in ways that were meaningful for them. Um, and they just got on and did it. And they were quite amazed that some people would actually be waiting for a mandate or an instruction before they started using it. And the other interesting thing I can think is that there are mandates around specific areas, so different countries. So you might see um, a BIM being mandated. And there's a lot of noise in the industry about you know, having those mandates in place. But when you look at the potential benefits, you know, there are other technologies and processes like um, or collaboration for a start, so ISO 19650, uh, lean construction, off-site manufacturing, and all of these things and more offer savings at least as big as, if not bigger than, implementing something like BIM. So, if we're going to start mandating things, I think it's important to start mandating you know, the, the broad spectrum of, of initiatives and, and technologies that can actually improve construction. And I think, again, what I see in Australia is a lot of companies are realizing the benefits that, that even small advances in technology can give them. So it might be something like improving their collaboration, you know, implementing a, a common data environment on a project and doing that consistently across every project gives them a real win. Uh, the same as maybe 4D construction. So companies are recognizing that they can consistently maybe save 10 or 15% of the time on a project compared with a, with a historical um, completion time. So those, those start to become huge cost benefits to a company. You know, if you're saving maybe a month on a, um, a schedule that's lasting 18 months, that's a huge saving in, in your overheads on site just by really implementing something that's fairly simple to do. So I, I'm kind of keen to see governments and clients encouraging uh, companies down that path. But equally, I think I'm seeing that the, a lot of companies commercially are just getting on and, and adopting that technology in a way that suits their business. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. We've had a few questions around skills, the role of the university educational institutions and Alan Fairweather uh, also put forward a question, but I'd like to ask you, uh, Mitch, as a stakeholder, what role do tertiary institutions play in providing training to your teams, JHG? Um, it's it's becoming something that's more it's more prevalent now with with the growth of we've putting together something that's very, um, in my experience, in in need, which is a competency framework for our team members. So. That would encapsulate something around the, the workings of having an internal framework, but also um, having an interface with a with a tertiary provider to get that skill set that we potentially can't give our team members in repetition. So I think definitely from my experience going through tertiary education is there's a lot of naturally fairly switched on people when it comes to technology because everyone's using it in their day in day out lives, but it's really that learnt behaviour of managing, managing different types of teams, different personalities within teams, understanding 
our business framework works, how to understand how to interface not only a technical issue, but also pieces of work that you are doing, converting that into wide ranges of audiences that you'll come across, especially within a construction company. You may be talking in, in a, a copious amount of detail to one team member or, or team, but then you have to convert that thinking into a high level to talk to a management management side of things. So that level of information and critical thinking that you do get from inside a tertiary education provider is has been really prevalent. And my team's far reaching. We, we have team members that come from a tertiary education background and some that do not. And you, to put a blanket across my team, you wouldn't know who those are, which goes to, goes to show that the experience that you do get inside a construction contractor is is so is so far reaching that it doesn't really bother me in terms of a background. Ideally when we do ask for new team members they come from have some tertiary background information, but that's only because we find that they've got probably a far more developed sense of those those learnt behaviours of managing team members of critical thinking in, in key elements that potentially 10 years of experience of someone without that tertiary background doesn't have, which is, like I said, my team members, they come from all different sort of backgrounds, but that tertiary education piece, I think, is something that we're going to build that competency framework around with um, some some key institutions here, definitely in the in the Sydney, Melbourne and, and Brisbane market that I think will really help our, our team members moving forward and not only get them a start into the industry in, in the wider technology teams, but also upskill our team members too. Thanks, thanks for that, Mitch. And getting right to the heart of it, we've had a very big question coming from Zoe. Good afternoon, Zoe's in Victoria asking you, Paul, what is the single biggest challenge to achieving the digital transformation? Over to you. Wow, yeah, okay, thanks, Zoe. What a question. <laughs> What's the one thing? Um, I think in my experience, it actually comes down to, to how, the, how the people implement that change. And that's in a number of ways. That's in how they, how they respond to the, the vision that's set by the company that's trying to change, but how they're encouraged and supported to then implement that, that change itself. Uh, and we often talk in, in these sort of uh, events around the, the aspect of, of technology processes and people. And I think what I'm seeing is increasingly, and, and seeing the sort of great work that, that Mitch is doing in John Holland with, with a, adopting technology, reviewing technology, adopting it and trialing it. There's a lot more of this technology out there uh, at an increasing pace. It's getting smarter, it's getting faster, it's getting a lot cheaper. So, and the technology side really, it almost takes care of itself. You know, it, it works to a, a surprisingly high degree. Um, we have to put some effort in into to integrating it and defining how we're going to use it on different projects. But by and large, the technology is there and it, and it kind of works. And really, that's maybe only 10 or 20% of actually making that implementation, that change. I think the processes are really important. And that's, that's maybe 50% of getting this stuff to actually work. Um, because if you've got all this great data, these great, these great bits of technology, that's not much use if people can't find that right piece of information or they can't do something with it in a meaningful way. So the processes around that are really important. But really, it comes down to every time making sure that people are educated and trained and supported to implement that piece of technology. And that's, I think that's where a lot of companies struggle to start scaling up some of their best practices. Uh, I see lots of examples uh, in Australia and, and globally where a project will try a piece of technology, they have a great saving, there's an article written or a white paper, and they can, they can trumpet the fact they've saved 10 or 20% of something by using that. But they then find it hard to adopt that on every project. And it's not because of the technology or the process, it's because the people are different, or the attitude is different to using it. So I think it really comes down to that, that people side of it. You know, How do we as a, an industry, as, as companies, as academic institutions? How do we educate people about what's there and what's possible and what that particular change means for them? Um, how do we actually train them then in the tools and the processes? Uh, and then how do we keep supporting them? 
because we can't just train them and give them the software or the, the piece of kit and, and let them free. We have to keep circling back and getting feedback and, and changing and tweaking what we're doing um, because that then lays the framework for the next innovation and the next rollout of, of things. So, yeah, I think there are lots of aspects to it, but I guess my, my key one is that it comes down to the people every time. Thanks, Paul. Well, Paul, I'd just like to stay with you because you talked about in your presentation about people who haven't yet started on the digital journey. And Farhad in New South Wales is asking you, how do we accelerate adoption of digital project delivery in Australia? And what are the lists of actions to take if we haven't started making any changes? Okay, again, good questions. So thank you for that. Um, I guess the in a way, I think COVID has done the industry a, a big favour. It's actually given a, a big um, sort of a kick in the right direction to having to implement technology. Just like in an office-based environment where suddenly almost every company learned what Zoom was and learned what Microsoft Teams was to be able to work remotely and to collaborate. We've talked about some of these innovations and, and um, technology uh, processes that have been around in construction for a while, but we've never been able to, to get that critical mass and, and implement them on a, on a big scale. With COVID, we've had to. So if you look at things like um, collaboration, um, specifically around common data environments, you know, making sure people have access to that latest trusted data and information for their job, it's sometimes been hard to implement that on projects because We've always had the site hut, we've always had lever arch files full of paper, we've had local computers and people collaborating in a very close area on site to get that information. But suddenly when they could no longer do that, when you, you could only have a certain density of people on site, you know, one person per four square meters or five square meters, it made it hard to have all those people present. You had to have them distributed, so they had to start using collaboration environments. And in an engineering and construction context, that goes beyond just having Zoom or Teams to, to talk and chat like we're doing now and sharing files. Those projects have realized they have to have a rigorous process. And fortunately, as Mitch mentioned, we have an off-the-shelf industry-ready standard in ISO 19650. So companies that want to implement best practice quickly and easily can use that reference document and really implement a, a best practice common data environment quickly and simply. Um, so COVID really has uh, has sort of encouraged that and accelerated the, the move here. Uh, the same with other technology. So drones have been used for a while now on construction sites for remotely inspecting and surveying work or performing inspections that might have been dangerous or difficult or smelly for humans to do. And again, now that we've had more people working from home, working remotely, those drones are giving people insights into what's happening on site. So in the simple example I shared about having an engineer on site inspecting something that has a defect or taking a, a series of photos of, a, of a, a services pit on site, I can just take those photos, I can assemble them really quickly into a 3D model that I can share with my teammates that could be in a different city or a different country or a different continent. And we can collaborate very easily, we can mark up things, we can get information and comments back to people on site without having to be present. So COVID's actually made us have to adopt some of these technologies, uh, perhaps in a small way, but it's made us get started. And I think more projects and teams are seeing the potential. Um, going on from that, the second part of your question about, well, if we haven't started yet, where do we start? It's probably the, the, the second question, most common question I get asked. The first one is, what will it cost? And then the second one is, you know, what, what do we do to get started? Where should we start? And it really depends on your individual business, your individual projects. You know, where do you think you need to start? Because events like this that we're having now, online forums, there are industry groups that will expose you to the latest and greatest technology and show you some of the things that are coming in construction around best practice workflows, uh, delivery methods and all the exciting stuff that's happening out on site. But every project and an organization has to decide you know, which of that technology is right for it. Uh, what are the things it's trying to improve? And it might be for your business or your project, uh, you're trying to reduce the number of uh, requests for information that get raised 
or you might be trying to deliver your projects on time and on budget because historically you know you tend to be two or three weeks late on handing over at the end. So for your project, you'll have some very specific uh, KPIs and benchmarks that you're trying to work to. And I think once you have that, you can put a business case around it and say, okay, we're trying to, for example, make sure we complete this project on time because we know we always go two weeks over. So what, what might help you to do that? And from what we've seen today, from what Mitch has explained and what I've shown, it may be that 4D construction is a way to go for your project. And you can then look at whether you try and adopt it for the whole project. Uh, you might do a proof of concept that tests the, uh, the technology and the process on a part of a project. So you might make a fairly modest investment in some software, in some training and some support. But from that, you can get a, a fairly robust case study together that might say we spent $1,000 and we saved $5,000 or we, we spent $5,000 on software and training and, um, and implementing the, the software and the technology, but actually we finished a week early, which saved us $50,000 in site costs. So you can quickly start to get some, some internal case studies that help you to roll out that technology on the next project and also give you some, uh, some assurance and some credibility within the organization. So when you tried some other technology, you're more likely to, to get the budget secured for that. So I think it's really important to understand, you know, what is it that really works for your business? And what are the things that, that you feel you need to improve? Uh, and then again, reach out to industry groups, to forums, to see what they're doing uh, and to look for guidance there. Thank you. And we have run out of time as always, and we do have had a lot of questions. Um, we did have a question, uh, Mitch, that came in just really quickly, talking about areas where there isn't a GPS environments. So putting a few with tunnels and shafts, etc. Uh, Mitch, can you just really quickly, uh, what, what's the plan there? What's, what does the future look like in that space? Uh, so, good, great question in terms of um, in a tunnel sense. Uh, it is something that's that's fairly um, difficult to deal with in, at the moment, but the conversion from essentially design-based software working in um, world coordinates or even local coordinates, that conversion into GPS um, is being done. But then also the, the growth of technology platforms that will have the ability to work offline and come back to the site office and be synced. Also, there is a, an ongoing development for an in-tunnel um, Wi-Fi that is, I know definitely from a JH perspective, um, has been extensively grown with some of the likes of um, Roselle Interchange and some of the other tunnel projects that are completing WestConnects at the minute. So it is something that is being developed and grown. And then what we do to mitigate some of that is essentially in a DE sense is really have the ability to have essentially location identifiers in a tunnel environment, whether that be putting change markers on the ground that if you have an offline model, you can actually see um, location points to navigate yourself to. Um, for instance, we have done that on a project at the minute where it does have change references on the ground. So if you're walking around with an iPad, it will tell you the change reference and also the cross passage location. So you can pretty quickly identify where you are. Um, great question. And I think it is something that will be developing as the technology comes to meet us. Um, but at the moment, we do have fairly extensive uh, workarounds to, to mitigate some of that issue. And some of our in-tunnel teams are fairly um, advanced. In, um, if you ever get the chance to go for a tunnel walk, please do so, because the guys that are building these tunnels, guys and girls building these tunnels in, in, the, in the major cities at the moment, they are very, very good at what they do. And any way that we can help them with technology, we, we take lieu of what their direction is and how we best aid in their their construction work. Thanks. Thanks, Mitch. And we really will have to finish there, but what exciting stuff. And I'm sure it's a topic that we will keep coming back to um, as it is so topical. Um, please join me once again in thanking Mitchell Erickson and Paul King for their time and insight shared at today's session. I'd also like to thank Engineers Australia's industry partner, Bentley Systems, for making our webinar possible. As always, we're looking for your feedback so to help us improve and plan future sessions. So if you could complete 
the short feedback form which is linked in the description box below. Once again, thank you for joining us this afternoon and we hope to see you at our next Thought Leaders webinar. Good afternoon.